like the eternal city that is Rome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Saturday morning show. Today, we have on Colin Rayhill. He is a writer, a contributor at Dynamic Catholic, a very popular Catholic organization that most of you know of. Um, it's the organization that really hosts Matthew Kelly's books, and so he'll be able to tell us a little bit about that. But we'll be focusing on his new novel today. Uh, but before we get to that, it would be good to really get the background details about you, Colin. So uh, would you like to share a bit about your story? Yeah, sure. Um, and thanks so much for having me on. And uh, also, I love your intro. Uh, I watched some of the podcasts before that. I really love it. Um, and everything you're doing with the channel. Uh, yeah, so I'm Colin Rayhill. Uh, I am right now a content writer at Dynamic Catholic. And before that, I was uh, a student at Harvard Law School um, until my second year. Uh, I left to really pursue a, a life, a career more directly in line with uh, my Catholic faith. Um, I had been coming closer and closer home, so to speak, closer and closer to the Catholic Church after um, straying a bit uh, during my Sunday school years. Um, and so while I was at Harvard, uh, I did a general confession, had a really powerful experience. There was just so much grace in that room. Um, and I, I made this prayer afterwards. I, uh, I said to, I prayed to Mary, uh, help make me into the person God wants me to be no matter how much it hurts. And, um, you know, I, I think all my prayers are answered in one way or another, but that one was very undeniably just obviously answered, especially the no matter how much it hurts part. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, I think nine days after I made that prayer, uh, I became really sick um, and flew home from Harvard, uh, spent some time in the hospital with uh, epilepsy-like syndrome or epilepsy-like uh, symptoms, but yeah. wasn't diagnosed with the syndrome itself. Um, just kind of uh, wacky stuff. But during that time, um, I was going to mass every single day. I was going to confession as often as I thought was reasonable, which sometimes meant two days in a row, uh, going to adoration. Uh, right near me, there was uh, the National Shrine of Maximilian Kolbe outside of Chicago. So I was going to adoration at, you know, all hours of the day and night uh, and just really growing closer to the Lord. So uh, in 2022, I was on medical leave from Harvard. And toward the end of that year, I was really starting to feel a call to give my life to Christ in a concrete uh, direct way. I explored the priesthood a bit. This, you know, discerned that wasn't quite for me, but, um, and I, I've always felt since I was little, uh, that I have a vocation as a writer. Um, you know, actually when I was six years old, I was, uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer. I was given six months to live and, uh, that from a very young age instilled in me a really intense fear of death. Uh, but I, it ended up being uh, the tumor stopped growing or stopped growing cancerously. And uh, I was diagnosed with a very rare condition uh, called virus dysplasia uh, and uh, just have to get it monitored. But, you know, I spent a lot of time growing up with doctors and hospitals. Uh, and at the time, I, I was not taking... I was going to Sunday school, wasn't really taking it that seriously. You know, my parents were separated. Um, I was not in tune with the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, I just didn't access it, but I, I really think that it would have fed me. So I was finding my meaning in literature, you know, in, uh, in like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, Camus, um, Faulkner, just really great writers. And even though uh, none of them were 
Catholic. And at the time, I, I don't know what I would have called myself as I was growing up. Uh, I really think God was, was speaking to me through literature. Um, and so that's, that's really how I ended up coming back to the Catholic Church was uh, through books. And eventually, uh, when I got really sick, I just nonstop read. Well, the first thing I did was read the Bible cover to cover in 10 weeks. Um, you know, no Father Mike Schmidt's uh, Bible in a year. I didn't even know who he was at the time, but that also would have helped. But I just uh, kind of dove head first in. And uh, I did something similar as well <laughs> when I was uh, converting, really. And that yeah. it really uh, gives you a lot of food to chew on for really the rest of your life. So it totally does. It has a huge impact. It totally does. And going in a little blind, um, I think, was an advantage because I was just so surprised by some of the things in Genesis, for instance. Uh, you know, the story of Judah and Tamar, just uh, Abraham's whole story. Um, and just the beauty of uh, the wisdom literature. And, you know, I've been searching for the truth um, my whole life through philosophy, but seeing, you know, uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, amazing truths that I've been searching for my whole life. Uh, it just absolutely stunned me and, yeah, converted my heart in a way that uh, I haven't been able to look back since. And I, you know, at this point in my life, and for, for a while now, for a couple of years now, I just, I love being Catholic. I love everything about it. And uh, so I'm really happy to be on this podcast and be able to talk with you about that. And also, uh, I have this novel out. It was released on August 15th, a uh, very special Marian day. Um, and uh, yeah, that, so that's called, titled Castor and Pollux, published under the name C.M. Rahill, like Colin Matthew Rahill, because obviously the initials make me seem much more important. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah, that's a brief intro to, to me. Yeah. So um, I did a little research. I don't do research much often on the guests, but this time I did a little. So I saw that you took a trip to Asia. That's right. So how did this trip uh, really influence your journey into Catholicism, into the church? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's really counterintuitive how it influenced me. So um I'd say at the beginning of college, I uh, I was getting interested in meditation. I was, uh, Sam Harris was really my guy. Um, Christopher Hitchens a bit too, he had passed on by then, but Sam Harris was doing some recordings for meditation. I thought, okay, this is the spiritual life I've been looking for, but just doing the recordings wasn't enough for me. I had to do, uh, I had to do spiritual retreats. And so I planned this trip to Japan, but before I even went over there, I did a 10-day silent retreat. So no speaking, no eye contact, uh, barely even any eating, no holding the door for anyone else, uh, and about 16 hours of meditation a day. Um, it was a non-religious retreat, and a lot of the talks were actually about Jesus. But, um, you know, it didn't, uh, it didn't affect me in the way that I thought it did. Like, for instance... I had not been thinking about Jesus much before going on this first retreat. And then I went on one and I swear it was after this talk uh, where the instructor was talking about Jesus forgiving um, his, his killers from the cross. Um, and afterward, I went on this silent walk and I just really felt like Jesus was walking with me. So I, I came back from that and uh, really dove deep into mystical literature. I still had this uh, trip to Japan planned, and I went on that trip to Japan. And also, I want to say, you know, I'm not uh, advocating any of this. The church, the church has the whole truth, so just go straight to the church. Um, that's what I would do. But that being said, God was guiding me through this whole process, um, through this whole seeking process, and I think keeping me uh, very safe on it. And uh, so I, I went to Japan. It was pretty much the same thing. Um, a lot of meditation, uh, but my meditations started becoming more personal and uh, more words, um, mental words. And 
it was like I was speaking to someone and I just started getting this very strong feeling that the truth I had been searching for my whole life was not a what, it was a who. It was an actual person that I could talk with. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I came back from that trip actually feeling like uh, my forays into Eastern religion while I found beauty there um, were definitely missing some, something and really they were missing someone. Um, mm -hmm. They were missing a person. And so it took me, a, I came back calling myself a Christian, uh, but not quite living the lifestyle it took. Uh, so I came back, that would have been my senior year of college. It's still, I put on a cross, called myself a Christian, but it took uh, a couple of years before I think I earned that name. And then it was, uh, it was at Harvard Law School that I, I really embraced the Catholic life. And I, uh, you know, it was, it was hard for me to believe because I had felt that something I was born into couldn't possibly be the truth. That's too easy. But um, there were just a an amazing array of uh, helpers along the way who, you know, one lady brought me to daily mass um, when I was starting to get my health back. And uh, that's when I, so I started going to daily mass every day and um, just so much providence in, in that journey. Um, even in the sickness, I, I really think that God gave that to me so that I'd have time to uh, spend with him. Yeah, for sure. And so like a lot of people in their spiritual journeys nowadays, like myself included, yeah. we were seeking like transformation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like I kind of um, went the stoic route, was in kind of like yeah. the modern self-help stuff, but yeah, uh, it really doesn't transform you so much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the relationship with God is something that pretty much calls you to the perfection of Christ, the imitation yeah. of Christ. And that's mm -hmm. painful, of course, the repentance stage, but then you find the freedom in God's love. Yeah. So that's uh, really where the spiritual uh, development comes in and all of that. And so we both have that uh, special connection there. And I'm yeah. sure everyone pretty much has to go through that stage. If they're a cradle Catholic, uh, yeah. they have to go through it if they want to become um, a real spiritual seeker in a sense. Because you can be a Catholic and really never understand it. You can be yeah. a part of it, but you'll never understand it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's very that's a very cool story right there. Yeah, and and on that point, you know, I went to Sunday school with uh, a lot of other just cradle Catholics, and I still know uh, probably most of them. And uh, I'm the only one I believe that's still practicing the faith, which is ironic because I was definitely the class clown. Um, but it's, it's also interesting, uh, what you say about, yeah, looking, you know, into stoicism, for instance, uh, because that I find a lot of parallels between stoicism and Christianity. Um, and that's also, you know, I think my journey started with reading the meditations by Marcus Aurelius, but, um, I'm actually, if, if you don't mind, like a quick question to you, um, yeah. how, uh, like when did, the line uh, with stoicism end, and you realize that you needed something a little more. Ooh, so my entire journey really started during the pandemic. There's a okay. lot of um, a lot less distractions, I should say, and mm -hmm. that really uh, set me on the path into reading, just in general, reading like classic uh, literature. So. I don't know why, but I started with the book of John. I just sat down and read that. And during my high school years, I kind of had that uh, general sense of indifferentism. Yeah. That pretty much everyone has nowadays. Like yeah. they'll say God exists or they'll say mm -hmm. they believe in Jesus, but they yeah. don't uh, ever go through that transformation transformation stage. Yeah. So that's where I was at. Uh, but after graduating high school, that was when the pandemic happened that summer of 2020. I had to really uh, go out and um, do things I've never done before, like leave home, leave all of my high school friends. And so I was like, yeah. who am I and what do I want to become? And so I was reading really that self-help stuff. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. I read that for like three months, just every night uh, in my dorm room before I go to bed. And so like that was after I read the book of John. And that was kind of 
developing my relationship with God in a sense. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, like it, it is a very religious book, Meditations, mm -hmm. uh, and not in a polytheistic way. It kind of mm -hmm. believes like in one God. So, yeah, providence uh, generally. Yeah. yeah. And so that influenced me uh, in a sense, but it wasn't really until I read just uh, the Bible front to back yeah. that December after that summer. That was re really when it took off. And then I read um, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. Yeah. And that helped um, kind of form like the structures because I had like all of this uh, biblical knowledge, but I didn't mm -hmm. know how to put it together. So that helped me really just uh, understand Christianity in general. Like all through that, I was starting to pray more. Uh, I was learning about Christianity more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of how that took off. That's cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, the Bible is a great book, <laughs> the best, you know, and written by the best. So for sure. Yeah. So did the Bible influence uh, any part of your story or, or it might be better to ask, like, what is the story about your new book? Oh, the novel. Um, so I'd say this is so one. Uh, the answer is yes, totally. Um, it influenced the entire thing. And, um, you know, some readers, I've, I've luckily gotten feedback from a ton of readers um, and, and really positive feedback. But one thing that uh, they've said is that it is a bit difficult at times. Uh, but the, I, I think the same with the Bible. Um, you know, reading through the Bible, that was really difficult. And a lot of times I didn't know exactly what was going on. Uh, and so I, especially in the second part, um, there's a, one of the main characters is named Isaiah. And really the whole second half of the book is written in the style of uh, the book of Isaiah. And it's, but the, the smaller uh, subplots, I take a lot from Genesis and uh, possibly actually judges more than anything else um judges yeah, i mean that's a great of, book right yeah there. and it's full of just these unbelievable short stories really is, mm -hmm. is how i read those um so it's it's very much integrated into every paragraph of of the novel and uh but to answer your question what it's what is it about um i would say that's the hardest question you can possibly ask me and you might get a slightly different answer every single time but uh i'll do my best to just lay out the groundwork for it so it opens with a mysterious narrator uh named slack um or at least that's all we know him by uh that's what he goes by uh, and he works he lives in london and works at a london law firm after graduating uh from law school in the US, um, a school outside of Boston. And uh, he has strange sleeping habits. Um, so a lot of times in the morning, he'll wake up and open a journal next to his bed and find, you know, just cryptic notes, poems, uh, drawings that he has no idea what to make of. And then uh, the novel basically opens with him walking to work one day at his law firm and brushing against a woman. And then he feels as she brushes against him, something in his coat pocket. And he takes out of his coat pocket uh, the beginning of a novel, which he must have started writing the night before. And again, just doesn't remember it. And uh, so he reads this. It's about a character at Cambridge who uh, is in love with poetry. And as he reads, uh, this very old book of poetry, he finds annotations on the pages and starts falling in love uh, with the woman who wrote the annotations. But, you know, he doesn't even know whether she lived 100 years ago or these were just written yesterday. He has no way of knowing, but he idealizes her uh, in his mind. And her name ends up being Maria. She ends up being really the, uh, at least for me, as, as the author, the most important uh, character of the novel and standing for the church really as an ideal um, and as her name would indicate. Mm -hmm. uh, but so things start to get really strange in the novel when Slack and the airport meets Owen. He Slack the narrator meets 
Owen, the character who he's writing about. And uh, they go on a series of adventures, misadventures. Uh, the first half of the book is called An Aesthetic Tragedy. It's about Owen trying to find fulfillment in life basically through uh, enjoyment. Uh, and a lot of that involves um, alcohol. Uh, there's some drug use. There's really just a lot of ways that young people today are uh, unfortunately trying to find fulfillment. Um, mm -hmm. takes, that part of the book takes place in Chicago and uh, that's where I grew up and a lot of, a lot of what I saw. Uh, and I should also say, I don't think it's giving too much away that a really good way to read the novel is that Owen, uh, is to see Owen as the soul that Slack feels he has lost. Uh, and so Slack is creating Owen in a way to, um, find fulfillment in life because Slack has come up short. He's this empty lawyer and, uh, this is his last ditch effort to try to find some light. And really uh, the two characters actually look pretty much identical, except that Owen has this really bright glow, this bright aura around him and Slack kind of exudes darkness. So anyway, moving on just to the uh, second half of this novel, it's there's it's split into book one and book two, and then a, uh, yeah. a sequel will be coming. Book two um, is called The Ethical and it's an ethical satire. And uh, it's a satire on kind of new age self-help stuff. And it's uh, Owen trying to find his uh, meaning in life through ethical principles that he creates for himself. So he creates his own ethical code and tries to live according to that. Uh, that also doesn't quite work out so well. So it's really slack following Owen trying to uh, create a soul in a Nietzschean sense. Um, you can't really do that according to Catholic theology. So it's a doomed project from the beginning, or at least in his better moments, trying to save the soul that he already has. Um, and there's Slack is, uh, has such intense narcissistic tendencies that really what's going on with him meeting the character he's created and uh, living in this, starting to live in this world more and more that he's created, the boundaries start blurring is that uh, he's, you know, there's this beautiful line uh, by St. Augustine in Carvatu say, um, and it, it's a good definition of sin. It's like caved in on oneself. And that's what's happening to Slack. He's his own mind, really, uh, his own world that he's created is caving in on himself to the point where he doesn't really exist in the real world anymore. He exists in his own world. So mm -hmm. toward the end, he gets uh, trapped in that. And I won't give away uh, what happens at the end, but yes. you know, I think it's a, I think it's an enjoyable novel, and I really, uh, I think Catholics will especially resonate with it because there are, uh, there are every other sentence is like a biblical reference. So um, I'm really excited for yeah. more Catholics to uh, to read it. Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent, uh, really, just summary of the book in general there, but. Mm -hmm. I can see just uh, the influence of your uh, story being placed inside that novel. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you mind sharing a bit about that and really what you would like the readers to take away from it? Uh, yeah. Just a quick note, I think like even this discussion that we've already been having, like reader or viewers, yeah. uh, not readers, viewers, mm -hmm. they can really relate to this. So it's like yeah. stories have that mythology that people are able to relate to yeah. and be transformed by. So, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll let you answer that question I asked. Just yeah. Like, what do you want the readers to take away from it? And what were your reasons for writing this? Yeah. So, you know, one, so on, on one hand, uh, I don't like the word audience. Um, on the other hand, it's, I find it very useful. So um, in terms of audience, I, I think anyone who's ever been a seeker, um, I think there is, a danger inherent in seeking. And as we were talking about earlier, um, seeking is kind of the default mode that a lot of us young people go into, um, especially when we fall into indifference. But we see it as uh, just good in itself. Seeking is good in itself. And I actually disagree with that. Uh, I wouldn't have always disagreed with it. I wouldn't have disagreed with it while I was 
seeking. I thought that experience in itself and experiencing as much as possible of the world was mm -hmm. the way to come to a knowledge of the world, a knowledge of self, and basically get to a point where, um, I, it's such a corny word, but enlightened, where things yeah. don't bother you and you understand uh, yourself so much that um, you're in total control. Um, but I actually think that when you are seeking, there's actually more negative paths you can go down uh, than positive paths. So I think of, uh, you know, the beginning of the Psalms, um, the opening line of the uh, Didache, uh, something along the lines of, there are two ways in life, one of life, or there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And so what I'm trying to do in this novel, um, which is actually built up, uh, built up of three books, but uh, book three, I'm, I'm saving for a sequel. It just would have been too long. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to show really the ways of, of death. And um, some of them I've uh, gone down or uh, checked out, I mean, both aesthetic and ethical. I mean, in the ethical realm, uh, some of the self-help stuff, um, the the new age spirituality is kind of baked in. And I don't want to alienate anyone that's new age. I think uh, they're actually, they can be easier to talk to and relate to um, and show what Christianity is about than um, someone who just flat out rejects um, any notion of mm -hmm. uh, a higher power. But so I, I found new age, I found that new age path, but for me, it, it did end up just being a path to self. Um, and I think when you only are going out in order to go back in, um, and really your whole life is dedicated to going into yourself, uh, that is a path of death. And uh, it's a little less obvious than the paths that I lay out in the aesthetic book one of Castor and Pollux, um, which, you know, that's uh, alcohol, drugs, um, romantic relationships, you know, the uh, not exactly church approved types. Um, yeah. So uh, th those paths are, I think, more obviously lead to tragedy. And that's why I outwardly put it as a tragedy. Um, at the beginning, the first half. So yeah, those are those are some of the things that I want the reader to take away from. But you know, the novel the novel as a whole is a path from darkness to light. So there is uh, there is a path of life. There is a way of life. Um, there's a way, of the life and the truth. Uh, and so the novel ends with that. And uh, the thing is, it's revealed by God. It's not something that we can reveal to ourselves, and especially. It's not something that we can create. We can't just create this new path and expect it to lead to something transcendental because we're not transcendental beings. God is. So he's the one that brings us up into his life. Uh, so that that is something that I really want readers to take away from. And yeah, to answer your question, how it how it relates to uh, some of my journey. Yeah. So this has really been a great discussion just uh, for the present um, century. I mm -hmm. think that's really the modern uh, problem that people have, like spiritual seeking. It's not a problem, mm -hmm. problem and solution, just spiritual yeah. seeking because the world was pretty much demystified. And then you have all these mm -hmm. philosophies coming about and people are really confused. And so they want to get out of that confusion mm -hmm. and they have the, the path of life or the path of death. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I can tell that you found the path of life. You're living a Catholic life now mm -hmm. really um, had that transformation, that repentance. Mm -hmm. and so now just continuing to spread that light. And so I guess my last question is like just your work at Dynamic Catholic. Mm -hmm. Have you had any good experiences there just mm -hmm. in uh, seeing how your work, how Catholicism can positively impact people's lives? Yeah. So so far, it's been absolutely the privilege of my life. And uh, every week, we on Fridays, we receive testimonials uh, from people who have read our books. Uh, and, you know, it could be something as simple as they read uh, Resisting Happiness or Rediscover Catholicism. And, you know, in all of these books, there's 
uh, these habits, just like try going to, on your way back from work, try going to church, just take the first step. And so what we're doing is giving them the first step into the Catholic life and they don't have to commit to the whole thing right away. I mean, I know when I was 15, um, you know, I transferred out of a Jesuit school because I felt like I had to commit to the whole thing and I, instead I rebelled. Um, but it is, you know, our books are uh, so applicably Catholic to someone whose life might be hard and they think that religion uh, is the last answer. It's so impractical when really it's, it is a very practical thing and having prayer is a practical thing and God in your life is a practical thing. So uh, we receive testimonials all the time about how it made them go to church once and then they start going over and over again, or they lost, um, there's one woman who lost her spouse and then she read every, uh, she read a chapter a day of uh, Matthew Kelly's recent book, The Rocking Chair Prophet, um, at her husband's gravestone. So it's just see more and more every week people being brought back into the church by these wonderful books. And, you know, being able to play any hand in that as a content writer is, uh, again, just the privilege of my life. Yes. Yeah, so thank you uh, really just uh for everything, for all your uh, conversation today, it really helped me in a sense. I didn't expect that just to really think about my own conversion story. So I'm sure it'll help lots and lots of people because there's lots of young people like us who will be able to relate to this. Yeah. So yeah, just uh, uh, where can the viewers find you? Do you have like a main website or anything like that? Social media? Yeah, so I have uh, cmrayhill.com. That's the website. Um, I also have an Instagram for the book uh, that's at cm underscore rayhill. And you can also find my novel on Amazon uh, at just by typing uh, Castor and Pollock's Rayhill, even if you don't remember the CM part. Um, so yeah, those are good places to find me. And if you go through the website, you can contact me, send me a message, and I'd love to talk to talk with anyone. All right. Yeah. So thank you again, Colin, and thanks everyone for watching this. May God bless you. Not of the modern world. For, for the, the modern, 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 modern world. Yes. That's right. Yeah, and, and... Fisher Baron. Hello, it's from the airport. Oh, yeah. Hello, we're doing nice good. To nice yeah. to meet you. So who are you, sir? I'm Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas. Yeah, do you want to bless this recorder? Is, that, is there a blessing for that? There's a blessing for everything. So, yeah, Lord, we ask you to bless this instrument and use it for good and for evangelization. Amen.